Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the ARC Advisory Group Smart City Podcast. So I'm Eddie Fiddler. I'm a transport analyst here at ARC. So I'm understandably thrilled to be joined by Tim McGuckin, the founder of Mobility as a Service America. Um, so, Tim, welcome. Thank you, Eddie. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, perfect. So I'm wondering if maybe we can start by just having you give a bit of background about yourself and, and your career so far. I'd be happy to. I've been in the sector, primarily transportation, for um, about 25 years. I studied um, uh, city and regional planning um, and uh, was really intrigued with how really people interact with their built environments, um, something since uh, childhood, frankly. And I studied uh, planning and uh, city management at Virginia Tech. Um, my first job out of college was working in the uh, DC Trade Association area. It was um, very, very uh, employment rich uh, area. Um, and uh, it was enjoyable because I worked in a, a large national trade association that was struggling with how to understand how um, to improve really mobility for, for commercial vehicles in urban areas. Uh, this was after um, the uh, transportation bill, Ice-T, um, gave a lot more power to uh, metropolitan planning organizations, a lot more uh, power to how, where to spend money. So my job was essentially to educate uh, regional planning departments about um, improving freight mobility as an important aspect of total mobility in a city. Transit's important and subsidies are important, but so is freight. I continued on the Transportation Association, uh, I guess, uh, arc of my career by going to ITS America, Intelligent Transportation Society, and got more into technologies and also the institutional issues um, uh, in between that that that's, that come up as barriers to technology deployment. So back then, ITS, the use of communications and computer infrastructure to improve mobility was fairly new. The, the approach to most of our state DOTs was just build more lanes. Um, and then uh, transitioning uh, uh, again to International Bridge Tunnel and Turnpike Association, I was the director of technology programs, and uh, was learned learned a lot about uh, tr sustainable transportation finance and tolling is one of the options. Uh, from there, um, uh, around 2000, uh, there was a DOSDOT initiative to uh, develop and deploy a uh, technology, a vehicle to uh, roadside communications uh, technology called 5.9 gigahertz DSRC. And that was very intriguing to the tolling industry because it might have, uh, they viewed it as a ticket out of uh, the proprietary systems they are buying from their current vendors based on 915 uh, megahertz. And uh, so we took the opportunity to participate in that. It was unusual for a tolling authority to care about that, but uh, the technology offered a way uh, that was based on open standards to finally move off of uh, proprietary solutions, which were more expensive than they needed to be. Um, and at that point, I created my own trade association to add value to uh, our efforts at the tolling in the tolling community. Why are tolling people at the table really wasn't that, didn't resonate that well. Uh, so we created an association, I did, I created an association called Omni Air Consortium, which was an entity that would design a certification program to um, assure uh, future buyers of these uh, 5.9 systems that they would be standards compliant and conformant and interoperable. Uh, and unless you have those uh, assurances, you would have to take the vendor's word for it. And oftentimes, uh, once you deploy in the field, even systems that are uh, so designed against the same standard, it's very intriguing. Different companies interpret standards differently. So in the field, you would have issues with interoperability. So we wanted to create a one-stop shop, and that was Omni Air Consortium. I did that for 10 years. And then um, one of my members, who was a recently certified entity, uh, we had backing up, we had DOT funding, we had members from uh, the car companies, the toll authorities and so forth. Um, they came to me and said, hey, uh, we have a, a very interesting smartphone payment app. Would you like to be our CEO? And it's a startup. And I thought, well, that's very interesting. That marked my transition to the private sector, Eddie. I became CEO of a startup. I did that for two and a half years. Um, and then I'm um, a very curious person. Um, I like to have a very varied career within the transportation 
uh, I guess, ecosystem. And I uh, then worked for Lidos, which is a, uh, a large uh, federal contract in the D.C. area working on connected vehicles. I didn't quite enjoy being part of a 15,000 person entity. It was just too bureaucratic. But fortunately, I was recruited again away to a, um, a startup uh, in the United States, which was based on a, uh, a division of a company in, in, in Portugal called Brisa. And Brisa had, for the last 10 years, built out a, a multimodal payment system in uh, the city of Port uh, Lisbon, where you could use uh, toll tag for parking, for fuel, for ferries. And soon it was using, being used for transit. You, they were developing an app for rideshare, and they wanted to grow their footprint in North America. So they hired me to build the business. And I did that for two and a half years. Um, and... Uh, we, uh, I ended that role um, two and a half years later. I, I grew them. I gave, I, I, I met my objectives. And when I left there last year, I was missing the public sector trade association uh, uh, game. I like big picture thinking. So um, I created Moss America. You introduced us as Mobility as a Service America. We just go by Moss America. And I've been there for about a year. It really was uh, embodied my uh, my own passions and in integrated mobility, my own observations about uh, what the next step should be for mobility. So there's a that's my history. Great, great, thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. so the, the, there is sort of a logic in that trajectory too. So that's very yes. cool. Um, so then, uh, would you mind telling us a little bit more about your current organization? Uh, absolutely. It will include um, why I created it, if you don't mind. Great. Um, Great. Well, you and I have talked before about um, going to workshops and sometimes not seeing the most informative or inspiring presentations. And it's just, a, just the nature of attending too many meetings. Uh, fewer uh, and further between you actually come across a, a good presentation that, that, that jazzes you. Um, and I'm, I'm one of those. I've been in industry for 25 years now. But in 2017, I was invited by my Portuguese company to go to a meeting in the UK. Um, it was hosted by, I think, ITS International. It was called Moss Market. It was a small workshop of about 150 people that was discussing this concept that really we all called integrated mobility, but they had named it mobility as a service. Essentially, the name, I believe, came from Europe out of um, Ertico and also uh, Moss Global, who was launching and had launched earlier a uh, integrated mobility app called WIM in Helsinki. So I went to the meeting and it was one epiphany after another. Uh, it was such an enjoyable meeting about this new effort to link all the modes together through uh, the use of technologies we all held in our hands. And also meeting the expected expectations of consumers and meeting other important goals like congestion reduction, environmental improvements, and so forth. So I was very inspired uh, by uh, that meeting. And after the meeting, um, I talked to the organizer, um, Andrew Barabal, and I said that I really enjoyed the meeting. I've known Andrew for about 10, 10, 12 years. I had written for his magazine, ITS International. And he goes, yeah, Tim, we'd like to do this in the United States. And I said, I'd love to help. Can I help? Because we need to learn about this concept in the U.S. more. And it was 2017. So it took, uh, we planned it for 2018. Um, things take a while. Of course, we get all get back to our jobs. And I was part of the meeting planning committee. And what I noticed as we were starting to fill out the agenda was it was a very Eurocentric view of mobility as a service. And what I mean by that is it was very uh, reflective of how uh, the European society is uh, in terms of its um, uh, very urban uh, society, very top-down, very uh, government-centric um, uh, sort of approach to mobility. Uh, transit was really front and center. It was almost um, uh, anti-car in a way. It was about getting people out of their vehicles. And I thought, well, that might not resonate in America and I really think this concept is so important. We need to get it done right. We need to start right. And by pitching it out as gets, get people out of your cars, I, I felt that at least two-thirds of America would reject it immediately. So 
we decided to create a, uh, an organization. I had talked to almost over the course of, of, of 2018 about the idea of, of a new association. I talked about 100 people, um, 120 people. And I said, this is my thought. This is my idea. And it was universal support for something different that reflected America's history. And um, we created uh, Moss uh, America. It was actually called Moss Association at first, but then we thought we really want to differentiate ourselves uh, from the Europeans, which have their own version of Moss, which is fine. But in order to make sure that it is that it, that it that it works here, we we created Moss America. Pretty pretty blatant, you know, America. Um, but Moss American is is an association that is advancing Moss to reflect the American form of mobility and. Uh, based on America's history, its sociology, its geography, its built environment, its governance, even the American spirit, so to speak, the freedom of choice, the uh, dependence on the automobile is much higher here. Um, it was the feeling that you know, the car will have a role in mobility for many years in the United States. And the second thing was was the not necessarily the celebration, but at least uh, equating uh, the value of the private sector with that of the public sector. Uh, we need uh, people that want to invent and innovate. And that means they want to do something to make money. And there's nothing wrong with that. So we looked at what is the new paradigm for, for transportation uh, under, under this umbrella called MAS. And it really was, uh, used to be public good. And I can go into details about that later, but the public good was really what drove most of our mobility uh, systems in the last 60 years. But now it was more still, you, you saw so many private sector folks making, uh, well, a friend of mine, uh, Larry Yermak from Cubic said, you know, all the cool stuff that's happening in transportation, it's coming from the private sector. And he was right. Um, uh, Rideshare, uh, connected vehicles, all those smartphone apps. And what's the motive? Well, it's profit. So we needed to have an organization that balanced out the profit motives and the public sector, public good motives, but also recognize that in America, we still see something like 95% or no, more like 90% of people are moving about in, in, in private vehicles solo. Uh, transit's maybe 5% of the, um, of, of, of the uh, share of rides. And much of that is just from a few cities in New York, uh, Chicago, Philadelphia, DC. So we needed to have a mobility as a service which reflected the American form of mobility. So that's what uh, that's why we created this organization. And um, we formalized it in February of, of 2019 only. We built a, an advisory committee that would guide, uh, I'm mean also a volunteer advisor, um, that would guide the organization, create the mission, and start developing products. Uh, ultimate purpose of the of the organization is to get together and talk about how to make Moss successful, and that has to include uh, principles like balance, inclusivity, financial sustainability, um, and and again, a preservation of the motive of of it's nothing it's not, not something wrong with trying to uh, make money at this. In fact, to get other uh, to achieve other goals, environmental uh, uh, goals, for instance, the system should be financially sustainable or you can't achieve those other goals. There's other, there's other more social good goals. And there's a great potential in Moss to do a lot of, to do everything we want if we can organize it properly and in a balanced way. So that's Moss America. Wow. Okay. So, so you came to the view that, um, in Europe, Moss was a great concept. It was, adv it was advancing, but there was sort of a, things were sort of skewed towards central control, the public sphere, um, with a very, uh, with very much a skepticism towards the private sector or even the profit motive. And so then you viewed um, that as well as the, the differences in built environment and history um, between the U.S. and Europe as hey, maybe there's a, a variant of this or, or a, a, a sort of sister idea to this that was more suitable for the U.S. Correct. Well, well said. So so then I'm, I'm curious about some of those distinctions um, because one of the central pieces of Moss, at least from what I understand, I mean, you touched on this as well, 
getting people out of their cars. Um, and what you kind of hinted at was that, you know, if you're in Berlin, if you're in London, the public transit system is robust and very mm -hmm. trusted. Um, but that's not so much the case in, say, Austin, for example. I mean, there's a bus network, there's not even a subway system, and Texas is car country. So your question is, how do we bring um, shared mobility to the U.S.? So your goal isn't so much to take cars off the road, but maybe to facilitate um, higher utilization, potentially um, like the Uber pool equivalent, um, ride hailing, ride sharing situations, um, wherever transit isn't really available or isn't really up to the task. That uh, yeah, that's accurate. Um, you're very perceptive. Um, you you did nail it. I think we we wanted to advance Mars in a way that again reflects the built environments that we've invested in for the last 100 years, and not try to uh, you know, create a um, a solution where 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 the where the public didn't view there to be a, a problem. They want to be in their cars. Um, we have uh, different, again, as I said, there's there's a handful of urban areas in the United States uh, that probably will deploy Moss in a way that Moss Alliance and Ertico view it. New York City is one, and there's a good example. They're trying to remove vehicles through pricing mechanisms or make at least people get into more than one person get into a car through their congestion pricing uh, policy, which has now been uh, approved. Um, Chicago is thinking about it. Um, if here, you've heard it spoken about in other metro areas, such as um, San Francisco. Uh, other areas, like at, you're right, Texas. It's interesting you mentioned Austin. I read once that... Uh, fare box recovery ratios, um, something like 7% in Austin, so like the lowest in the United States. There's nothing wrong with that, but it just shows that um, people are voting with you know, their, their, their wallet. They're, they're buying cars, and, and, and we need to recognize that um, in order to improve aggregate mobility, you need to recognize people's choices today and not try to do a uh, to, to not you don't want a revolution you want to evolve I feel that exposing people to multimodal options many of which might be based on rubber tired vehicles will slowly get them to I think that hey I don't need my third car right or my fourth car in some families or they don't need my second car so it's just a matter of um, Reducing the amount of vehicles through natural um, choice, not through uh, being compelled, which I think societies in Europe and other maybe larger urban Asian societies are used to, the government compelling them. And America, again, Moss America is to advance the Ameri advancing Moss to reflect the American form of mobility, and I mentioned our society, our spirit. And all of these technologies uh, can do tremendous good for, for urban areas, but they shouldn't be uh, dictated in terms of mode. And just like America in the aggregate is different from Europe in the aggregate, there are suburbs in Europe and there are cities in the United States, but even across the U.S., there's very different types of cities, as you know. You mentioned Austin, very different from Boston. Um, Oklahoma City is very different from Philly. Denver might be different from uh, San Francisco and so forth. So Moss will manifest itself differently in each region. So we're not really looking for um, dictating a solution. We're looking for uh, defining sort of the principles that inform your framework uh, that then informs the business model for you, Boston, for you, New York, for you, Denver. So we just don't see a, a federal top-down 
approach to Mars being successful. It's unlike the connected vehicle initiatives that the US DOT funds through say Smart Columbus. That's really not talking about how necessarily they'll be deployed. It's, it's testing the technology in different contexts. First, it's getting the radio system to work. Second, it's getting it to work to a certain set of performance measures. Then it's getting it to work at an intersection or between vehicles. Moss, and it's, all of that is, you don't, there's no Verizons involved necessarily. There's no uh, necessarily value added services to get, you know, to, to get people to leap onto the platform. There's no platform really, or it's a safety platform. And it's, it's incredibly important for us and, you know, but it's being driven by DOT and NHTSA. Moss is a commercial, uh, it's the essence of it is commercial. Um, a lot of folks are interested in it because it gives people a, a touch points with the customer. I read articles on a concept called the passenger economy. I think Deloitte or somebody had a paper that predicts it will be worth trillions of dollars sometime. It's the value of all potential goods and services that can be sold to you as a passenger in a vehicle as opposed to a driver. So we need to recognize that in America, at least, it's a combination of public and private sector motives that ultimately will yield the best for all parties, city agencies, the public, and the business. They can't be ignored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, I think you're, you were somewhat hinting at this as well, that just because the U.S. is so diverse, I mean, you have a very, very compact um, few cities like Boston, New York, but then you have sprawling, you know, metropolises like Dallas and, and Austin, as well as uh, suburban areas and then rural areas, of course. So, so there, there really is no reason for a, a federally mandated or federally um, scaffolded approach. Um, do you, do you see a possibility for um, maybe almost a com completely European model? for a place like Boston, where, where it really is, you know, let's get people out of their cars by giving them attractive, affordable options. Because personally, you know, I, I do live in the city of Boston and <laughs> uh, myself and a lot of people I know here, um, we are literally dreaming of the day when we can say goodbye to our cars or only use them once every two weeks to go, you know, into the, into the mountains or something. So, right. Personally, for, for this sort of demographic, um, I would love it if, if Uber Pool, if Pool were um, better optimized, they were electric, so they were cleaner on a clean grid, um, if the transit system worked better, and if, if bike lanes were, were um, more conducive uh, to, to biking, <laughs> that's a safe biking and, and things like that. But Boston is, is a very old city, and it's, it's one of only a few that are, that are like that here. So in your vision, it would be totally compatible with your vision that there'd be one set, um, one sort of approach for, for these old European type cities in the US, and then a whole plethora of other approaches for every different geography and, and built environment that exists here. It wouldn't have to be a one-stop shop. It wouldn't have to be a cookie cut. No, no, it wouldn't. I think that's the key to successful deployment is the ability to recognize that each region is different. It's idiosync there's idiosyncrasies between even Baltimore and DC. Uh, they're only 45 miles apart, but they're very different cities. But um, our approach is, is that you probably can't, we look at it sort of as a continuum. Um, I talked earlier about paradigms. Uh, the paradigm for transportation in the history of America has uh, every innovation that you think of, whether it's, um, Let's see, uh, turnpikes, canals, railroads, and then toll roads have all been driven by the profit motive. It was, the turnpike was, you know, there's something like 50, there were 50 turnpikes at one time in Virginia. There were more like three or 400 uh, that were authorized in New York City, primarily put together by farmers who pulled their money uh, with builders to move products to market. And for those who didn't have products, they paid a toll. Uh, by turning a pike, they can get on access to the uh, to the road. Profit motive. Um, railroads were really a profit motive. Uh, and then 
we had toll roads, like the largest, uh, the first toll road in the United States preceded interstate quality road, but it was preceded the interstate highway system was the Pennsylvania Turnpike. I think it was started in 1937 and opened in 13, 1937, which I think coincidentally is the same year that IBTTA, International Bridge Tunnel and Turnpike, came into existence. It's a funny thing about America. As soon as there's an interest, there's an association. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting about America. <laughs> we jumped out. Know? We do. We love organizing. We like having our voices heard. Um, but anyway, um, all those were private motives. But then the interstate highway system came and it was you know, the defense network. It was to move military gear and pre- prepare in case we were invaded, uh, to put it very simply. Um, and in fact, tolling and, and the gas tax were debated for a long time as to the uh, funding mechanism for the interstates. But I think the tolling technologies were too expensive. You had to build booths everywhere, right? So they chose the gas tax. So for 60 years, we were really the public motive. Um, so what I'm getting at is the paradigm is, is, is the public motive is being in, intruded upon by the um, for-profit motive. The public good motive is there. Um, it's certainly in your, um, even the Uber has, has it in its uh, documentation, Lyft, what have you. But the private motive is, is there. So the paradigm, uh, I talked about a continuum, uh, informs the framework, which is uh, on which you build your, your business model. And uh, frameworks are really shaped and bounded by goals and principles. And if you're the owner of that, or if you're an actor in that, in that say, that regional MOS ecosystem, that framework, um, what do you want to encourage or achieve through the deployment of your of, of your system. So I think where Moss America is trying to, uh, if there's any set of standards, it could be that you have paradigm, it informs the framework, which informs the business model, which will uh, identify the system actors in that business model and the services that they provide. And finally, the customers that they serve, where can you actually have an imprint? Yeah. Where can you actually have a, um, an impact? Where can you, uh, be creative. And I think paradigms are, are pretty much, it's, you don't really don't have much say in that. United States, at least. Um, I'd argue that in Europe, their paradigm is always public good. But in America, it's almost been private profit. But anyway, um, business models, again, will form from the frameworks. And um, so what are the principles that you want to achieve? Uh, what are the principles that a framework should have? that will create a business model that gets, gets us what we want out of MOS systems, wherever they're deployed. And we have summarized five at MOS America. Um, these principles of a MOS ecosystem, one is inclusive and it's very public good minded. It's, we all need mobility. Everyone needs, do we have a right to mobility? It's a personal viewpoint of mine, but not all of people believe that. But if you look at it, from a pragmatic standpoint, if we can't get from A to B, it certainly hampers uh, society, it hampers the economy. So uh, mobility should be inclusive. We all need access to mobility. We mentioned it before. You want options that are affordable, uh, sustainable. Um, I mentioned that uh, financial sustainability, that services should somehow uh, be financially sustainable. Because if you can't have a system that's financially sustainable, you know, it won't be able to meet other very important public goals, such as environmental goals, congestion, emissions, and so forth. Uh, low friction is another principle. Services uh, should be easy to understand and use, uh, meaning that if I want to download the app, it should be easy to do. If I want to see my options, it should be fairly easy to do. Um, low barriers to entry is another principle. This is sort of like a, a friction, uh, which is, uh, uh, but on the, uh, the provider standpoint, meaning I, I shouldn't be prevented from getting on the platform of a mass ecosystem or a mass network operator. Uh, we should have exchange of data. We should not have uh, application programming interfaces should be cheap or free. Um, Uber shouldn't have it all, for instance. It should be openly accessible. And then uh, balanced uh, from an economics standpoint, and this is where we talk about, again about public good. Uh, 
an ideal MOS ecosystem would, would also per permit the, uh, the uh, subsidy uh, by uh, taking revenue from one uh, mode to subsidize an underserviced part of the ecosystem that cannot pay for itself. So there's a mix of public and private um, aspects to this, these principles that, that we push at, at Moss America. Inclusivity, sustainability, low friction, low barriers to entry, and balance. And if you have those principles, how they manifest in the business model will be different between Boston and Austin. So that's what we're looking at. You know, Moss America doesn't believe that we can really, or should say, what is the business model for Moss? We really aren't going to be an organization that changes the paradigm, but we do have an opportunity to inform what the framework is at this point and who the actors could be in that framework. We recommend that mobility network operation operators such as Uber or Lyft today should, there could be many in a city. Uh, anybody that has access to, uh, to users or knows how to manage an account, knows how to process payments, should be a potential mobility network operator. That includes entities like Verizon. They have 150 million subscribers in the United States, or, or maybe locally it could be um, here in Fairfax County, the Fairfax County Water Authority has over a million customers. Maybe they could become a MOS network operator. Who knows? Because they connect with the client, they understand payments, they could run a credit check. That's important too. Um, so there should be multiple MNOs, mobility network operators in a city. And I liken this to, um, talked about this before, uh, Eddie, but before I go on, um, I can stop unless if you have any comments. Yeah, yeah. So I, I really like the, uh, the sort of um, higher level uh, system view that you're describing. Um, so you, you start with the paradigm, which is yeah. beyond any one group's control, of course. Um, again, that, that ties into the fabric of the, the history and the society mm -hmm. like you were getting at. Um, the business models and individual, you know, vendors and, and service providers are kind of at a different level for what yes. one group can really do. Um, but the framework is something that people can come together, talk about, and hopefully set in a direction that'll facilitate beneficial um, business models and vendors. So that's actually a very cool approach, I think. Um, but I did want to I did want to question you a little bit. Um, and there there were a few pillars to your framework, and and you mentioned potentially, um, for the sake of underserved uh, pieces of an ecosystem, having a almost cross modal subsidy or some kind of flexibility in in that regard. But yes. then, on the other hand, uh, you mentioned the importance of competition and not having one of these network operators run the whole thing, having many ride share providers, many scooter providers, or, or what have you. Um, so then how would you possibly facilitate that sort of cross subsidy if, if each organ is completely independent? It makes sense if you have one, you know, large transport monopoly, and, and this does happen, say, at like Am Amtrak, right? They have a profitable route and many that are not, and they siphon money from the profitable corridor to, to the others. But if each one of those is run by its own entity, um, the unprofitable one simply wouldn't exist. Great point. We have a model for that. Um, it's called the interstate highway system. It's um, We collect taxes from all uh, 50 uh, states. Um, some of them provide more tax back to the government than they get back. Uh, California, they call them donor and uh, donee states. Um, states like New York, uh, Texas, California, send more back in their federal gas tax than they get back in the form of highway uh, aid. And they use that money to subsidize the, um, the interstate systems at the same level of service, same design standards in Wyoming and Idaho and Montana who don't have nearly the population, thus the tax base, to build their own and maintain their own interstate quality systems. So the vision was really, let's just call it, Military mobility, national military mobility needs to be complete. It needs to be the same across this entire geographic area called the United States. So we would create a system that would build the, the network and, and pay uh, taxes. Everyone would chip in. 
And again, we would create a, uh, an even, uh, the, the quality of the interstate, the, the ability for Wyoming's interstates to move a bunch of tanks and trucks is the same as California's. So that's your system. So the U.S. citizenry, the government is used to uh, the, the, the concept of cross-subsidy already. Um, they probably forget, though, that it happens. Most people, if you talk to them on the street, don't know that. Right. Yeah, that, that uh, Californians don't, don't know that they, they're helping to pave Wyoming's roads. And, that's, and, that's, and, and unfortunately, in society, people are getting more concerned about things like that, which is kind of sad. They just want theirs, right? But in the context of a city, you would have a similar concept, and we named it. We mentioned actors. Um, you mentioned a bunch of scooter and e-bike entities, you know, uh, commuter buses, uh, transit, public, private, what have you. They're all service providers, uh, just like someone who owns a hotel is a service provider. They operate a lodging, uh, a theme park. All those are part of, say, uh, the uh, – services you can buy through booking.com, right? Who is an online travel agency, like an, an OTA. They don't own any of these things. They just create the options and you can pay for them in one app. It's very similar to uh, our vision for uh, Moss, where the mobility network operator um, might not even be Uber, but they might be. They would be the entity that coordinates all the options onto an app and, and charges you for them. And if there's multiple mobility network operators, uh, one, how do you adjudicate issues? Maybe they're not, one of them is not treating a service provider correctly or and getting back to the subsidy. How do we get entities to, how do we get uh, an underserved, a transit desert served? Well, by taking profitable re revenue from profitable uh, uh, routes and services to subsidize unprofitable routes and services. And that would happen conceptually through a, uh, the USDOT equivalent would be a public mobility commission, a PMC. It would be the place, the entity that's probably populated by city agencies, representatives from private sector, citizens groups, hopefully not too large, not too bureaucratic, that would adjudicate set policies and principles. We believe uh, that the city ultimately and the citizens themselves own the streets that they use every day. And they have some say in dictating how private entities extract rent from them, right? So you can see a time where someone, it's, it happens with port authorities and mobility authorities now. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey has the George Washington Bridge. Um, hanging underneath that bridge is a path train. The path train's uh, fee, uh, ticket fees are, are priced and subsidized by the folks who take the toll road above it. If they price the toll, uh, if they price the path train to, according to the cost of the ride, it would be so expensive it would push a bunch of people up onto the uh, highway deck, causing gridlock. So you can create these. This you can orchestrate. We already know how to orchestrate different modes and subsidize for for the best aggregate mobility. But now that we have these new actors, Eddie, the private sector, the Ubers, the Lyfts. Um, who else is, did I jot down? Uh, Best Mile, Move It, Via, and even companies like Ford. Who knows? They need to be part of this Public Mobility Commission, at least be subject to the, um, the regulations. And this is another conversation I've had with some other people, maybe, maybe even uh, you in, in, in a prior conversation, is the evolution of mobility as a service, this I kind of like liken it to um, Airbnb and Uber. They didn't ask permission. They asked forgiveness. But ultimately, uh, even though people were in love with their services, and they're very popular, they started to become regulated. They started to have caps placed on this wild west. I see the same thing happening. It has to happen where we go from mobility as a service to mobility as a utility, where a organization that has an aggregate view a public view, but also mixed in with the un understanding that private sector needs to be there, if not encouraged, can create a system that, again, replicates the vision of the interstate highway system in cities, but with all these other technologies, all these other modes, again, the goal being to improve aggregate mobility and make it inclusive for everybody. 
And back to the OTA, you know, if, if you own a hotel, um, you join up with an OTA, bookinghotels.com, and you get access to the entire world. You're on their platform. You might be able to reduce your marketing budget. Now you're on their platform. Everyone can say, I want to stay in Boston. 50 hotels pop up. You sell that hotel for $150 a night. Well, actually, it's cheap in Boston. So let's say 400 a night, okay? <laughs> Especially in, in springtime <laughs> uh, or more. But uh, booking takes 20% of that. And could you replicate that in a city where the PMC takes a percentage of the revenue and gets to decide how to subsidize and where it wants to subsidize transit and mobility deserts? Might not be 20% because that's actually quite, quite high. Could be five, could be 7%. So the concepts are out there. The models are out there. Um, you know, cities, they totally want to retain control of their streets. And then by extension, whatever, however, they define what a Mossy ecosystem is. Uh, they need the data that's being collected by the bucket, <laughs> by Ubers and Lyfts. Um, they might, ha they should have a say in maybe what types of vehicles are allowed in the city. Do they need 50,000 scooters? No, probably not. Um, they might have a say in understanding where the scooters should be placed. Um, but still at the same time, they don't really know what Moss is yet, as you know, what their role is. We're trying to inform that what their role could be is probably a big player in the, uh, PMC. But while they're having all these discussions about whether they will move forward or with Moss or not, companies are already integrating public transit apps into their platform and they're going to be the go-to Moss providers. Is that, is that, is that what we want? So maybe. But I think that just like I can buy the same airline in the same hotel and the same Disney, you know, experience from booking, I can buy it from TripAdvisor. I can buy it from Hotels.com. So everyone has – every MNO should have every provider of a service on its network if that provider wants. Getting back to the OTA model, if I'm a hotel owner, I might find that booking sells most of my rooms. I'm not going to sign up or give as many of, as my rooms to TripAdvisor until TripAdvisor does a better job. So there's a bit of a incentive for the MNOs to do a better job or they'll lose service providers. They won't subscribe to them. They won't have a service level agreement with them. So it's it's a fun, it's an interesting, again, we've, we've seen this before. It's happening before, but some of the, uh, we've also learned some lessons. Can a, the Loudoun County Connector, which is a bus which runs from the hinterlands of, of Northern Virginia into D.C. three times in the morning, three times at night, afford a 20 to 25 percent hit on its revenue from the MNO? No, it, it doesn't. It can't. So that's why we need a public mobility commission. Uh, again, it, it creates a role for the cities to maintain a, some level of control in their infrastructure and now MOS ecosystem, but also recognizes the needs of the service providers providing the service and the folks that are integrating this as meta operators and, and presenting it to the public in very user-friendly apps. That is a critical part. If you don't understand it, if it doesn't look attractive, you're not going to try it. So. Wow. Yeah. There's, there's a lot to talk about there. Yeah. So let's, let's just take and choose mobility as a utility. I yeah, just look up the concept of the utility. Yeah. We heard that. Um, though, though I will say a similar concept has, has been arising in terms of uh, social media, Twitter, Facebook, um, that they're becoming a utility or maybe should be treated as such, a utility to transfer and facilitate information and communication. Transport is, is almost more fundamental or, or at least as fundamental. But, of course, it just leads to all these questions of given the track record of of the public sector in a lot of different um, aspects, can they be trusted to uh, uh, facilitate this in an efficient, like you said, less than bureaucratic manner? Um, it's a bit of an open question. Um, but wow, exactly. It's very yeah. interesting because there, there will of course be you know potential efficiency improvements and 
almost, you know, mobility arbitrage, value arbitrage, opportunities within a region or within a city. And so having an entity that can see it all and have some authority to, you know, to sort of siphon a little bit of that value from one to the other for the sake of a, an overarching goal like access or, or, or ecological goals. Yes. Um, that, that could be really something. Well, to, to continue the thinking about uh, going back to um, Mass America's principles, we don't have to save the environment as, as, a, as a principle of a Mass ecosystem because we think that if these other principles are present and we have the, the framework that we, that, we, that we have sort of uh, like a blueprint for it, which includes the Public Mobility Commission, we have multiple MNOs. What will come out of that is hopefully that an MNO, a mobility network operator that might just focus on um, decarbonization, if you will. Like if you use this MNO, eco MNO of Boston, all your trips are environmentally sustainable. That as long as they have access to the platform, as long as they can be part of the ecosystem and are held to certain standards by the Public Mobility Commission, can't you see that uh, distinct types of MNOs will come about serving particular needs of large minorities of people who care about specific things? There could be a MNO that's like Uber Black. You know? So you want to pay, you want to get there fast. It's going to be expensive, but we know you value your time. So use this MNO or this option within the MNO. So you can meet society's needs in a more, I think, natural, organic way rather than through dictates. Maybe, I think, I think. Um, that's why, you know, we have faith in other actors that will clean the air. You know, the, the, you know, should Moss be defined by its, or measured by, successful Moss measured by how much particulates are removed from the air due to this Moss platform? I, I hope not because... Um, there are a lot of other actors out there that are already trying to clear the air. There's there's um, environmental uh, organizations, and they're already looking at the role of the automobile in that. Uh, 14 or 15 percent of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from this sector, if not more. And we have the electric vehicle. That's really just happening, regardless of whether MOS exists or not. So when we see MOS saying, well, our MOS is cleaner, it's like, good for you. But I want it to work. And if I happen to get into a vehicle with two other people, hey, I am, I am contributing to uh, cleaning the environment. If, and, if I, uh, and if the city wants to, you know, hopefully incentivize this, let them do that. It's their business model, not, not, not the government's, not the federal government's. So that's it. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, and, and that does tie into more of a, a U.S. approach, more of a public good, agnostic or semi-agnostic uh, vision. It so, is, though. Of course, as as, as we all know, um, you know, climate change and air pollution are you know important considerations here. Yeah. But maybe it shouldn't necessarily be the role of Uber or any or a scooter company to be accountable just for that. There's other let, groups. Let uh, let the public the agencies yeah. that are charged with that as their charter. So, there already are, you know. I would see the 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 eco uh, MNO being something popular in, in in California before Texas, right? Right, right, right. And in places like California, where there are uh, market based, um, you know, pollution reduction methods, mm -hmm. they, they of course have that for the power sector. Um, I think they're they're starting for transport. Uh, in, in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, there is a, a commission working on um, a cap-and-trade program for transport fuels as well. Mm. Um, so that that's the kind of thing where, uh, you know, these operators would be agnostic to that. If, if the prices of fuel change, then whatever happens, happens in the market. Um, so that's... It is. I mean, uh, we, you know, at the end of the day, what's... We think MOS is more about seamless movement, not always or automatically about 
reducing pollution or even reducing congestion or travel times. It's about seamless movement. And let me give you an example. If it takes me $60 to get downtown from Reston, Virginia, where I live, to D.C. for a meeting, and it takes me 31 minutes to do that, um, well, maybe there's an option to take an hour to do that, but it costs me $25. But the uh, entity takes back roads. Um, but in that vehicle that I'm riding in, he has 5G connectivity, which we might have in three to four years. I could be as productive in the back of that vehicle with his little fold down desk on my laptop as I am in my office. So it's still Moz. It's seamless movement. It's options that meet my particular desires, meaning I want to get down there cheaper. Um, and uh, I don't mind spending an extra 30 minutes in the vehicle. So congestion is interesting. I was uh, talking to somebody the other day. When you look at the size of the U.S. economy. This is, this is, $20 trillion a year. And I think um, Iteris or Enrix put out a huge study about a really comprehensive study in the cost of congestion of $300 billion a year. And that's, I don't know how they come up with it. It's based on the value of people's time, maybe the, the additional fuel burned and maybe uh, some valuation or value placed on, neg on, on the pollution. That needs to, I don't know. But you have a $20 trillion economy and a $300 billion congestion tax. What's the what's that equate to? It's a 1.5% tax. I know people that are more in the for-profit paradigm, you know, uh, camp saying, well, that's not a big tax to pay. 1.5% is, is nothing. So what are we getting so upset about, right? Not talk to a DC commuter. It's going to have a different point of view. But in the aggregate, you know, it's not a big tax to pay for a $20 trillion economy. Um, Metro areas, of course, pay a higher tax. I looked it up. New York City Metro, they have um, a $1.4 trillion economy and $37 billion in congestion costs. Same study, 2.6% um, tax. So it does vary. Um, but anyway, that's just, that's just an observation. Right. That, uh, yeah. That's what I was yeah. going to jump on, actually, that, again, going back to Boston, not to keep shoving that down your throat, but that same <laughs> Inric study uh, ranked us as number one, gave us that honor for congestion. Wow. Um, so, so that tax, the one percent, the one and a half percent, is is probably an aggregate across the U.S. Oh yes, yeah. some places it's, it's, it's is absolutely a lot more devastating than that. And maybe I'm just, uh, you know, too I get too upset while driving, but <laughs> I have a feeling that that they may have underestimated the human cost of the stress, for example, things like that. Um, You're so that probably said, right. You can, you can quantify it. That's a very good point. You can see it as a tax on the economy somewhat. But. Some some A planner, a, a colleague of mine in Philadelphia, this is a long time ago, said, well, uh, congestion means a vibrant economy. Not, not to a degree. <laughs> if it's gridlock, it's not. But I can get her point as 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 a chief uh, transportation person in Philadelphia. If it's um, and that was certainly a a fear when they instituted the congestion charge into London that it would hurt the economy. I don't think those fears have come. Have, have, have really nothing was realized bad. I mean, it was just people are paying to come into the city, but uh, so it's it's not really economic doom if you if you restrict people through pricing. I guess the next great uh, test of that will be New York City, uh, which anyway. Yep. Yeah, so, so, speaking of a U.S. approach or a U.S. example, you can't get much bigger than New York. So. No, you can't. You yeah. can't. And yeah. uh, I, I read um, back to transit statistics that something, whatever the transit growth was in the last, it was a certain set of years, more than 50% of it was attributable, attributable to New York alone, just one city. So you look at cities like regions, uh, like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, there's a lot of cross-county traffic. There's a ton of that, probably almost as, not quite almost as much as going in and out of the city. But in the D.C. area, there is a tremendous amount of traffic skirting around uh, uh, D.C. to go from Virginia to Maryland. How do we improve their experience? How do we improve their, uh, how do we create options and choices for them? So Moss is not just about suburb to CBD. 
Um, we're not talking about oil here. We're talking about central business district. Um, so, again, Ma should reflect consumer wants, consumers, the geography, uh, how we built our, our – but at the same time, um, should enhance our, our aspirations and the ability to achieve what we want, what we aspire to. So, uh, the other thing I wanted, I, oh, I go ahead, go ahead. Comment about and, um, was, I said, Moss is about seamless movement, not always about reducing congestion or travel times. Um, what was the second one? And I said some smart things. So sorry. But anyway, uh, the other one I thought was interesting should be talked about, and it relates to, is that MOS is the disintermediation of transportation. It's an insertion uh, of an en another entity between people and the providers of transportation services. Just like booking.com is the disintermediation of business or pleasure travel. I no longer have to call Wyndham United Airlines in Disney World. I can book it all on one app. And um, what does that mean for transportation? Uh, is it a good thing? Well, in the hotel sector, and I've been tr I've been reading a lot about this lately because I think it's very apt to the to the situation with Moss, is that. 20 to 25 percent is a massive cut just for the right to have your hotel on some platform app. It's often, outside of finance costs, the biggest cost that a hotel will pay is the commission to the meta operator. Wow. The biggest. That's 25 percent, 20 to 25 percent. So now, then, of course, that makes me, I mean, a large number like that makes me think. <laughs> well, Uber maybe charges twenty is, to twenty-five percent. Yeah, maybe that that reflects the value that those operators bring. No, it it, it reflects. Or maybe it's a, it's a market failure or a bit of both. I'd say it's a bit of both. From my studies, it's um, uh, like booking. Let me give you some stats, kind of fun ones. I'm looking at three companies in the travel space: Marriott. Booking Holdings, which owns companies like Booking and Trivago and a couple others. So you think you're using different OTAs, but you're really not. There's been a uh, consolidation, and it's becoming anti-competitive. We need That's why we need entities like the Public Mobility Commission, in my opinion, and then Uber. So Marriott, it's a hotel chain, perhaps the largest in the world, it has 6,000 hotels under management with 1.1 million rooms. That's that's more than a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure that they are responsible for operating. From commissions, their revenue was $22 billion. So they own or they operate 6,000 hotels. That's a lot of real estate. Their revenue is $22 billion. Um, their market cap is $42 billion. And their share price is $135. Now, enter the OTA, booking. They provide a lot of value. It's easy. It's seamless. They don't own anything. They don't have any infrastructure. They just their software, data, and apps. Their 2018 revenue. Well, I'll, I'll equate it. The 2017 revenue of Marriott was 22 billion. This OTA, just one of them, 12.5 billion in revenue. Their market cap is twice as high as Marriott, and their share price is $1,900 a share. This is a meta operator. This is this an intermediator. Uber, now their 2018 revenue is losses. Their share price is 33 billion, but their market cap is still around 54 billion dollars as of the other day. So we're looking at where the value is in Moss, and wherever the value is, wherever is wherever the money is, so goes the power, the ability to prevent access, to to, to allow access. That's why I think it's incredibly important to really develop this framework that we're talking about to give everybody to have it more balanced. So the disintermediation, um, it's, it's not a model we want to go down. We want to go forward with 
Uber drivers, 25% commission. Um, here's another interesting one, Eddie, if I may. Uber Eats and, and, and apps like them. There's a great story about uh, an entity in India that that's, it was a, a delivery app. You, you know, they're, they're huge now. Right, right. right. Well, they, they got into the business. They created an app that was much like a hotel OTA saying, hey, get on our platform. We were going to advertise your little business to everybody in the neighborhood and just sign the service level agreement, which gives us certain rights. And the small restaurateurs in India said, sure, that sounds great. What can go wrong? Well, what went wrong was um, their commissions are 15 to 30 percent. They were allowed through the SLA to do things such as after five, your second guest eats for free or all you can eat. It was putting restaurants out of business because they didn't really didn't know what they were signing. This is the worst case of the um, MNO. We don't want to go there. We want to have an opportunity for that balance through the framework to exist with hey, users have a point of view, the people who you know use your services, service providers like the restaurateur or the, or the uh, county bus connector has a point of view. Cities certainly have a point of view. So if we leave it to one sector, you said something about the public sector. Yeah, they're not very responsive in a way. Um, they don't really get that rewarded for reducing or improving efficiencies or reducing um, you know, labor pools. And like, uh, so they're, it's the wholly different incentives between a public sector transit agency and Lime, the scooter company. You have to have a mix of that. That's why we start talking about aspects, the concept of mobility as a utility. So the disintermediation is happening and it can happen in a way that benefits the people that are providing the service and the people that use the service and the city and actually the, uh, the, the meta operators. If work. I think you've really hit on one of the most important aspects of what this is going to look like going forward. Um, if, if we're talking about about fees and commissions around 25 percent that could really I mean that that can put a, a service provider out of business completely so so I see what you mean the public commission could potentially act as a as a smoother of this as a yeah as an antitrust almost guarantor um, for that sort of middle so that for the intermediary hmm Wow, it seems like your group has, uh, has thought about this quite a bit and, and is, is looking to get this done the right way. Um, so, so I want to ask, um, how are you getting this message out there? Um, who are you working with? What are your marketing avenues? Um, how are you guys trying to make this happen? Um, as well, that's our, thank you, Eddie. I would admit that's our biggest challenge as a small organization, um, independent. And let me, uh, explain that, um, there are other associations that address this, but from a different angle. Moss Alliance is 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 the European Association for Moss um, the Mobility on Demand. The Mobility on Demand Alliance is the one from um, in the U.S. That's probably they're both. No, this is this is. I'll be very blunt. The business model for mobility trade associations is not a good one. <laughs> Okay, um, we are essentially a volunteer group, um, and in order to make it, uh, Moss Alliance, for instance, is a spinoff from Ertico, and it's subsidized by Ertico, which in turn is subsidized by the European Commission. So we, we joke amongst our advisors here at Moss America that they were sort of born on third base, right? They already had a lot of, they had funding. Mobility on Demand Alliance, which is very much like the Moss Alliance in terms of a federal a uh, top-down prescriptive approach, very transit-oriented. Um, they work very closely with um, FTA. Is a spinoff from ITS America, which is supported by ITS America. So, uh, Moss Alliance, Moss America here, um, we're a bit at, at a bit of a disadvantage. So, we don't have um, a lot of outreach. We're still building up, and we'll be having our first meeting. 
we speak at certain places. This this um, podcast is one way. So thank you very much for the opportunity again. Um, I'll be speaking at Tier B uh, in January. These are small but thought leader type groups, right? Uh, and then we have our mosques uh, association meeting in March. Um, it's being held in conjunction or with, in partnership with the Contra Costa Transportation Authority, who's on our advisory board. So that's what we're doing. Uh, not as much as I, as I think is needed and not as much as um, I want personally. Uh, it ta- it's a lot of work to build an association, especially without a, um, a subsidy or a stipend. So um, we just say yes to all the opportunities that, that, that are given to us. Do you want to speak? Yes. About what again? Right. Oh, just yes. We want to come. We want to come. Um, and if it works into our travel schedule for our regular day jobs and things like, again, we're all volunteers. Um, we have, you know, I've, I've have, we have 18 advisors um, and uh, they speak to their colleagues and peers about Moss America. And so primarily it's meetings, it's opportunities like this and not as much as we think is needed and not as much as certainly we want to do. I see. I see a bit of a guerrilla approach. Uh, yeah, you're almost forced. To, you're almost forced into it. Um, but but in your in your early um, you know avenues to get this message out there, what has been the response? My early avenues to get this out here has been uh, personal conversations with thought leaders, primarily of companies who might ultimately want to sponsor a meeting or support or tolling agencies or other agencies has been universally nearly, I can't say universally, that's total 99% supportive of the need for a different approach to Moz as what they've all heard about coming from Moz Alliance or the Mobility on Demand Association. We need to, we need the balance. We need the inclusivity. We need to uh, re- re- recognize the value and the role of the, of the private sector. Um, it's been, but at the same time, MAS is not an imminent threat or necessarily an imminent opportunity. People don't know what to make of it. I think one of the biggest challenges, Eddie, when you're starting an association is either Join me because I can give you opportunities or join me because I can prevent something bad from happening to you. When I created the Omnier Consortium, I had a couple, it was different. I had a, a subsidy from IBTTA. I had uh, members from IBTTA that credentialed me, credentialed the association when we went to USDOT and we got a grant to develop a certification program. I guess I saw that we had a very well-rounded group of entities and wow, you guys already have a great well-rounded team. We'll give you money, but it was, you're tired of buying proprietary toll systems, right? Well, if you support Omnier consortium, we see a way to get out of that. We're going to create a certification program that will give you choice and reduce prices. So very clear pros and cons. If you don't do it, you'll be trapped forever, right? So it was a clear financial incentive and we don't have that necessarily in mass it's really a high level concept that people kind of get when you spend time with them it's hard to explain mass in an elevator pitch <laughs> you know yeah 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 mm-hmm. i try <laughs> i i do too i mean tolling is easier i remember going i just tell the story i was on the 10th floor of a building and a guy, very smart guy from D.C., a D.C. attorney, you think they're smart people. Oh, you work for IBTTA. How can we always pay for roads? We just keep paying tolls and keep paying tolls. When is it going to end? And by the time I got down to the first floor, I had explained to him that, well, sir, do you own a home? Yeah. Um, well, are you close to paying it off? Well, you know, 15 years. Well, what's going to happen when you pay it off? Well, I won't have... I said, well, you really don't... Won't you have to maintain it? Won't you have to invest in it to maintain its livability? And you just saw the light bulb go off in the guy's head. Oh, yeah, maintenance. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I turned the guy in, in 10 stories. Um, but it just, you know, what's Moss? Well, uh, it's like, it's, it's integrated mobility. What's that? 
What do you mean mobility? I mean, honestly, mobility. Eddie, uh, I, I have a friend who has a, has a little group called Mobility Plus. It's a, tra- it's, it's a consulting group he's starting. He gets advertisements from China selling him wheelchairs, right? Uh, um, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah mobility for, is different for people. It's, um, it's, it's depending on who you're talking to. Mobility in, 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 in Florida or at Sunrise Assisted Living is very different from going to tier B and talking about mobility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it, it, it suffers from that. Uh, it's, it's still a concept. It's again, we don't even know. And where do you sit on the, on the, on the spectrum or the continuum of mass maturity? Mass America has a levels of mass table from zero to six. So that can help you understand it. But again, it's getting the word out. Right, which right. you know we talked about the challenges before. Mm-hmm. This whole community has a uh, its work cut out for it, that's for sure. Um, but let's end on a on a particularly positive note. I guess my last question would be, um, in in your view, what companies and and ideas around transport um, that are coming up in the U.S. right now, which ones are you most interested in? Which ones are most promising? Um, which particular initiatives or companies? Um. um that's a good question um if i go across different uh, private sector companies and perhaps um, public sector entities that i've been paying attention to i think we're all paying attention to uh the columbus smart city uh, initiative one of the most interesting advances has been the um uh, i think a, a partnership with siemens mobility and and, and bite mark on a common payment platform that's that's a, that's huge. Uh, being able to pay for all your services, and mobility on one platform. I think there should be more than that. Like we talked about the concept of multiple MNOs, but essentially one platform of payment. So Columbus is something to keep an eye on. Uh, as far as uh, other entities, um, I'm going to say Contra Costa Transportation Authority. Randy Iwasaki. Uh, he won a pretty decent sized grant uh, from Federal Transit Administration to. Uh, deploy seamless mobility services in what is essentially more of a suburban type of county. I think that's, it's not all about cities. It's all, it's about, you know, congested areas period, which could be all of three stories tall. You know, it's just a, a congested suburb like Virginia beach, one of the worst areas for traffic. And I think their highest point is a, is a, is actually like a trash dump. Um, but no, nothing against Virginia uh, beach. It's a great town. I lived there for a little while, but it's flat. And, but it's congested as hell because all the roads feed into these few arterials and everything's congested. But I, I, I think Best Mile is, is, uh, is, is a, a class leading entity and, and the group of entities that have apps that allow other providers to use to connect different modes of service onto one app. They're not necessarily an MNO, but I think they could aspire to be. Uh, Via is another one in that area. Um, Lyft is, is very intriguing to me uh, because they are focused on uh, options, you know, linking in scooters and, and, and other sorts of public, uh, public vehicle options on their platform, which is fairly recent. So um, I think Lyft is, has it right. Um, as far as car companies, I just think I'm, I'm intrigued by what Ford is looking at. They, they, since they're one of the few vehicles that uh, car companies are auto OEMs, it's calling itself a mobility provider. What does that really mean? Um, I think they understand that they might be selling, rather than individual cars, fleets of vehicles. Um, so those are the, uh, the entities that, that, that I'm looking at. Um, but again, it's still... I, well, that's that. I stop talking. That that's how I feel. That's that's um, what what I'm looking at in in the terms of the moss space. I don't see much of interest from the federal government. They're focused on um. They termed it mobility on demand. And it's out of the FTA, and it's really focused on first mile, last mile. My concern in that area, Eddie, is um. I asked a question the other day is, are cities, are city transit authorities subsidizing their own demise? Meaning there's 
that's kind of dramatic, but what I mean is they're working in partnership with Uber and Lyft to subsidize first mile, last mile rides because people can't walk a mile or whatever. They don't want to get whatever. So it's a very interesting thing. And it was, um, I think it was a great uh, initial, uh, a good effort to improve the perception of, of transit as being hip and cool and, and, and responsive. Right. Uh, but I tell you, companies like Uber, who lost $5 billion last quarter, don't want just first and last mile. They want all mile. So that they let them into the tent and are they going to take over? Well, that's why I think we'll ultimately need mobility as a utility. So, mm-hmm. and, and that's why conversations like these and, and the ones that you're having um, with all our other kinds of stakeholders are are key. We, we want are. this done right. If we're going to you know, bring this back to how this conversation started, we want this done right in the U.S., in Europe, everywhere, but um, we want this done in a way that it takes off and, and makes mobility a little bit more accessible, efficient, easier, less of a hassle, and, and everything else we're looking for. Mm-hmm. So, so, Tim, it's been a, it's been an awesome conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, and, hey, best of luck with Moss America, and we'll be talking soon. Okay, Eddie, thanks again for the opportunity, and I, I appreciate it. And, uh, again, thank you. Have a good one. Thanks so much. Okay. Tim. You too. Bye. Bye-bye now. Thank you.